there's something quite exceptional that's happened. We have discovered the largest deposit of clean energy in the world in the last five years. And it's right here in America. It happens to be about a third of the cost of oil. It's cleaner. It's production and consumption creates high paying jobs and it also reduces costs to the, to the consumer and there probably means that we can save some money overseas as well. Tell me about U.S. gas supply if you look back 10, 20 years and today. Well I would even just go back five years ago. I mean five years ago we were in a state that I think had existed for the last 10 or 15 years, which was we were in decline and we were running out of thing, new things to do. Um, there was a feeling that we had to have access to new areas, whether it be in the Rocky Mountains or offshore in Alaska, because everything was worn out in the U.S. But my eyes, brain, head were all turned by the discovery of the Barnett Shale, which we kind of came to the realization was a real thing in 2004. And so, in my view, the modern gas industry is going to be defined as having occurred in about 2004. And you say modern gas industry, what does that mean? <laughs> well, I mean, we found gas first, I guess, for commercial use in 1840 yeah. in the Fredonia, New York, actually out of the right. Marcellus Shale. So we've been using it for 165 years and looking for it the way we used to look for, or it's the way we still look for oil, which is in conventional traps um, where you're your odds of success are relatively low and, uh, and, and the scale of your discoveries is relatively low as well. Now we look for gas in all the areas we were told to avoid um, before, which was in tight sands um, and then in shales. And the way I kind of think about it is shale is the kitchen of the oil and gas industry. And it's, we, everyone's always known that oil and gas was cooked in the kitchen. Um, and then the food was taken out, or in geological terms, expelled into, into other formations around it. And you can find a lot more food in the kitchen than you can in the dining room, generally. And so that's, that's kind of my an, an analogy. And so we've moved from this perpetual state of uh, scarcity um, to now this new state of uh, abundance that I think we'll be in for decades and decades. As you look out 10 to 20 years from now, then what do you see? Well, I, the future, I think you can look at it a couple different ways. One, you can look at it from how much gas is there out there. And in the United States, I think there's about 2,000 trillion cubic feet of gas. 2,000 trillion. Yes, which would be two quadrillion cubic feet of gas, which is enormous. Or said another way, it's about 100 years of supply at present. Uh, consumption standards and to imagine that you never have to do make any other discoveries and you've got a hundred years of any resource is just extraordinary. You're comfortable that the resource is there. Mm -hmm. Does LNG play a role in that? Sure. I mean that plays a role in the sense that if somehow we're wrong about the uh, ultimate amount of gas in place in these plays that if you ever get in a bind for some reason you can import LNG. I mean, yeah. when, when the, the days of hurricanes like Katrina and Rita causing gas prices to go from $7 to 15 it's a physical impossibility. Uh, the Gulf of Mexico matters less today from a percentage of U.S. production basis than it has for the past 50 years. And, we, and we've hardened the asset base of the U.S. gas industry by yeah. bringing it on. And if for some reason we had a supply problem in the U.S., you can import um, about 10 BCF a day of natural gas. That's about 15 to 16 percent of our supply. So the days of price spikes because of shale gas, the decline of the Gulf of Mexico, and the uh, construction of LNG importation facilities basically guarantees that gas will trade in a much tighter range going forward. Which That's is good great. for the consumer. It's a huge news for the consumer. Yeah. and. And, and at the end of the day, it's good news for the producer. I think we can see an industrial renaissance in this country. I think for several decades to come at least, we should have the lowest natural gas prices in the industrialized world. All these companies that say they ship jobs overseas because of high energy costs, I think can bring them back. Um, you are going to, I think there's a way to sell, I mean, to go to the American consumer and say, I'm running for president, and oh, by the way, my platform is this, okay? I'm gonna let you buy any car you want, small car, big car, whatever, and I'm gonna provide you with the ability 
to fill that car at $1.50 a gallon rather than $3 a gallon. It's going to be cleaner. You're going to feel good about yourself and the environment. And you're going to have more money, uh, which will create more American jobs and make your life better. And uh, the fuel that you put in your car, American natural gas, will create more jobs for your fellow citizens as well. Because I think what the U.S. natural gas industry has done, the independent natural gas industry, remember, this has been brought to you by right. just about a dozen yeah. companies that you know most people in America have never heard of. But we might have brought a way for America and the world to be able to increasingly say no to OPEC and, and see oil prices at, at lower levels and see greater CO2 reductions in the atmosphere without having to throw a wet blanket of um, cap and trade across the U.S. or the world economy. If you're really interested in improving environmental quality in the U.S. from a CO2 perspective as well as particulates and other and pollutants, you have to focus on two areas. You have to focus on coal and the electricity sector, and you have, to you have to focus on the transportation sector. Sticking with electricity, you have to say, okay, in that coal stack of, you know, all those plants that, that come on every day to make electricity, what are they like? Well, um, as with almost anything in life, there's, there's 20 or 30 percent of them that produce by far the greatest amounts of pollutants. And so, we're not suggesting that um, you could eliminate all coal consumption in the U.S. That would require uh, basically a doubling of uh, U.S. gas consumption. I don't think that's reasonable. But you can say, hey, let's go after the ones that are 30, 40 years old, and let's think about a cash for clunkers deal. It worked for automobiles. Yeah. Um, and the difference is this cash for clunkers doesn't require that there be new natural gas plants be built. We've got plenty of plants out there right now. They just don't run very often because um, right now we haven't yet internalized the external costs of burning coal. If you were to yeah. do that in some way, then gas would be a bargain. Now we're in a position where we can take a big step forward, a great leap forward, and for that to happen, I do think uh, Washington and, and at the state level, you have to have um, uh, policy changes and you know, at state level that means electricity shouldn't always be dispatched um, without regard to um, environmental costs for example. At the national level it means uh, do you encourage, how do you best encourage automobile manufacturers to develop a propulsion system that for example is widely adopted in many places around the world. Manufacturers need to be pushed by government, and then, and then government has to help on the infrastructure as well. I mean, there are, yeah. there are certain things where government has to be a catalyst, and here is a great example. And, and the benefit to the federal government being a catalyst is that they can bring to the American people a fuel that's cleaner and cheaper, creates American jobs here, and enhances our national security. Some have expressed concerns over the process of hydrofracking. Are these warranted? I think there should be concern about, frankly, any industrial process. I mean, and it just so happens this particular procedure is not something that's been developed in the dark of night by, uh, you know, Halliburton um, a year ago. In fact, it's 60 years old and it's been used a million times and we think is it, it really has a million? A million times. I mean, there are huge economic losses to us if we go in and put a bunch of chemicals in, in somebody's yeah. water supply. I mean, So you're motivated to make it safe. Absolutely. Yeah. And so as a consequence, we always have surface or near surface aquifers behind at least three strings of tube, uh, casing and, and tubing, mm -hmm. um, including cement. And so basically, you know, you have somewhere between three and six inches of steel and concrete through which you could imagine that somehow something could get through there, but the reality is it can't, and there's a good reason for that. We have a lot at stake. At, we don't want our gas to, to go there, and we certainly don't want to pollute anything. So um, we're, you know, we're trying to be an open book. We've got a website called hydraulicfracturing.com. Um, we list all the chemicals being used. I mean, I've had people say, uh, wow, you use hydrochloric acid. I mean, whoa, isn't, you know, isn't that a bad thing? Well. Yeah, I mean, if you drink it, it's a bad thing, but you probably wouldn't let your, your kid go to the swimming pool next summer 
if you weren't sure that they were using hydrochloric acid to keep the pool clean. I mean, so there's a lot of things that have long names and, and have kind of scary uh, names associated with them that are everyday chemicals that we use as well. So we need to demystify education. that education, and, and then we need to have people come out and, you know, watch what we do for a living, you know. We invite you to a frack job because it's actually pretty cool, and I think you would walk away with a better understanding that what you're scared of, which is surface water pollution and near surface water pollution right. physically cannot happen. But it's become a well-publicized number that we use four million gallons of water and that's a lot of water when people just think about it. But when you think about it in the overall context of water withdrawals, it's actually quite small. And we're saying, hey, why even make it an issue? We've figured out ways in just the last six months to economically recycle our water. And that does a couple of things. We use less water yeah. and we also have fewer trucks on the roads um, taking that salt water, that produced water, to disposal wells. Pretty soon we'll get to a tipping point where, where that realization will sink in and people will say, let me get it right. Um, natural gas is a third the cost of oil and, and it only has half the, the, the CO2 emissions of oil and we don't have to go fight wars in all these strange places and we don't have to spend three or four hundred billion dollars a year importing oil. I mean, is that all true? Because if it is true, I mean, it, it, it's, it's a new world that we live in. What I mean, prevents that? Uh, I think. First of all, lack of knowledge, um, number one. Um, number two, in, inertia. Um, I, I think that um, you know, people haven't been thinking a, a, about this, and so they're kind of set in their own ways. And then I think you know, active, um, um, active opposition by some people who would be uh, um, happy for our uh, uh, devotion, addiction to these uh, dirtier fuels to be maintained, and there are people who have vested interests in that. But all those things can be broken down because it, you'll find it. You know, I think I think history does not ignore revolutions, does not ignore inventions that are cheaper, that are cleaner, that are better. Okay, they ultimately get adopted, and so the question is: uh, Do you sit back and let it play out over the next 20 years? Or are the issues so important that you say, I need to get involved here?